The fourth subcategory will deal with the willingness to contribute to a welfare in diverse societies. If we are less willing to be altruistic and share our money with other races than we are with our own race, then is that an example of how racism is natural and that we're more willing to show solidarity and be altruistic with people who look like us and we identify with? Or could it be a result of an old, nasty idea that still lingers on in the back of our minds? In the quest to discover whether or not racism is natural or not, this book, Welfare, Ethnicity and Altruism, gives us several pieces of evidence useful when attempting to discover the answer to our question. It is a book that has compiled several studies that deals with altruism, charity and ethnicity. The conclusion from the various separate studies gives us a homogeneous answer. Humans, but not only humans, have a limited range of nepotism to distribute and it runs along ethnicity or race. Why is this? Is it the result of persisting ingrained ideas of racism, or is it the result of human nature? Why are we more altruistic and more willing to share when we are living in homogeneous societies rather than when we are living in diverse societies? Why are we more willing to share with our own race or ethnicity, and why, if this is the result of a racist idea, does this behavior apply to our closest non-human species, the chimpanzee as well, and how they deal with their tribe versus non-tribe, also as with humans, based on ancestry? Recent empirical findings in the economic and political science offer confirmatory evidence. The book presents two separate studies that compare welfare expenditures around the world both indicating that the more ethnically mixed a population becomes, the greater is its resistance to redistributive policies. A study of donations to the United Way of America charity finds that white Americans give less when their communities are more than 10% non-white. Still, another study, based on observations of giving to street beggars in Moscow, finds an ethnic nepotistic effect. In a fascinating twist, Cohesive regional ethnic groups, such as the Francophones of Quebec, can sometimes leverage additional welfare from the central government. On a related theme, a global survey finds that the most generous foreign aid comes from the most homogeneous countries, and that ethnic diversity hinders economic growth in all except a small number of wealthy societies. This book brings together a distinguished group of scholars, evolutionary biologists, political scientists, sociologists, anthropologists, economists, primatologists, and human ethologists. Contributors examine how ethnic diversity can affect the level of welfare and cross-ethnic charitableness at both national and cross-national levels in industrial and tribal societies. A study of meat sharing in chimpanzees provides a cross-species comparison as well. This book breaks new ground in advancing our understanding of multicultural politics, ethnic competition and conflict. With all this said, given the amount of evidence, again, is this because of human nature or is it because of ingrained ideas? In either way, it's yet another evidence that whatever the cause may be, again, it's a display of racism. Why? Is another question, which we will hopefully answer the further we go along in this journey. Wake up! Great, he's coming to us. Put the light away, you're blinding him. Artyom, are you okay? Oh, well, you sure did give us a scare. 
Artyom, who is that? Hey, can you stand up? Stop here! Hell, this place giving the creeps. The control unit is broken to smithereens. All the lines are cut. Not sure time you think we're going too smoothly. Vlad, get your tools ready. We need this door open. Artyom, you stay here and cover our backs. We don't need surprises here. Watch your backs, boys. The fifth subcategory will be the most serious category, and it will show some of the dangers of neglecting to consider that man's nature is tribal, and that basing society on the notion that race can be made not to matter is a dangerous idea. Alternatively, that it is not man's nature that is dangerous to ignore, but that we are ignoring that there's an idea that still lingers on, that still affects us all. It will be dealing with ethnic warfare and ethnic tension. It's important to note that I'm merely going to bring up an incredibly small fraction of the amount of problems that has come about as a result of us ignoring man's nature and that man still has an idea that hasn't gotten rid of it, that we are ignoring our racist inclinations. In studying conflict around the world, the United Nations found that the vast majority of civil wars and conflicts have at root been ethnic or racial conflicts. We must understand, respect, and appreciate ethnic differences. Then we can allow people to have their own living space and their own independence and sovereignty. When we work for that reality, we actually will lessen conflict and hatreds. Look, for instance, at the massive migration of Jews Palestinian areas. Did that result in love and peace and brotherhood? Are the opposite. Ignoring the real differences that exist among humanity is like saying it doesn't matter that mercury is dumped in our streams and oceans. For a long time, we didn't think it mattered. The United Nations commissioned an exhaustive survey of civil wars and internal conflicts and human rights violations across the globe. And you know what it showed? That ethnic conflict was the driving factor in the overwhelming majority of civil wars and societal group conflict. Just pick up your newspaper or turn in the news and notice the ethnic and tribal racial conflicts that plague our world. Nations and regions that are more ethnically and religiously homogeneous tend to be the most peaceful. And when you think about it, doesn't that fact make good sense? Isn't it logical? To you that people who are more similar, having evolved over tens of thousands of years among themselves, might find more harmony and peace among people of similar traits and personalities than in societies where people are thrown together who are very diverse. February 23rd, 2000, California's Pelican Bay facility. As if on a signal, the yard erupts. 9.38 a.m. Hispanic gangs attack a rival African-American gang. 200 inmates plunge into a bloody battle. From nowhere, weapons emerge. Homemade knives, even steel batons. The riot lasts half an hour. When it's over, 15 inmates have been shot. One is dead. System. You gotta side up with somebody, so you usually side up by your race. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, racial tensions were flaring up across the country. 
they would soon hit American penitentiaries. Race-based gangs like the Mexican Mafia and the Black Gorilla Fed and usher in a new era of violence. Hey, Y'all got stab Yeah, I got yeah. one right here. Right here. Right here. Right here. Right here. Here's mine right here. Here's mine right here. Kind of weapons. These pencils. Break him off. Pencils, but I got this. Here's a knife. Prison. Yes. Prison. What was it over? Kill whitey. Kill whitey. So what if they say white people? Yeah, okay. Yeah, they, they want. They only want to protect white people because they know that the blacks will just take care of themselves and everyone will just take care of themselves. And if you don't think so, you must ne have never been in prison, have you? Because <laughs> I have and I damn well know what my place is and who will take care of who. <laughs> Wait until you see how people behave when they're put in a cage before you fucking react. If you don't know how human beings act and behave when they're put into a fucking cage, then you don't fucking know. In Central California, one prison is on the brink of war. This prison is dangerously overcrowded. 120 violent criminals live in one room without a single cell wall to separate them. Oh man, this place is messed up, man. In the brewing race war, this could be Ground Zero. Welcome to State Prison. Behind these walls, a race war between the Southern Mexicans and whites is reaching a breaking point. Cristala suspects today's escalating war started because the whites broke Southern Mexican rules. Every yard that it's run by Southerners, the whites have to abide by our rules. These are the consequences of people not bowing down to Southerners. We have the people, uh, we have the weapons. In the gym, the Southern Mexicans outnumber the whites by a ratio of seven to one. The whites occupy three bunks in the middle of the gym. The Southern Mexicans surround them. The other three groups, the Northern Hispanics, blacks and others, are positioned on the opposite side of the gym. The whites are trapped in a battlefield where they can't win. At exactly eight o'clock, as four whites gather for the season premiere of their favorite show, Prison Break, 20 Southern Mexicans emerge from the bunk areas and attack. Other white inmates see the riot and rush to help, but they manage only a few punches before they're knocked unconscious. The Southern Mexicans are armed with crude shanks and batteries they swing in socks. I looked over and saw that it was, it was a racial riot between us and the South Siders. And so I ran over there and got involved to try to help out because there was so many of them and there was so little of us. I had to try to help out as much as I could. All nine white inmates were badly beaten. I got a black eye. Um, some knots on my head, and I was stabbed twice in my back. I'm not thinking that any one of us was a target. I think it was just, just get rid of the white guys pretty much. Best way to describe it would be there's different countries. Sometimes we're the big country, sometimes we're the small country. And every country goes to war. We saw, we saw everything is about race. We try to make sure you know, we stay together, anything can happen at any given time. The inmates segregate into five ethnic groups. The Southern Mexicans, the Northern Mexicans, the whites, the blacks, and the others, which includes Asians and Native Americans. Let me ask you a question now. Can uh, a, a black inmate come and play basketball with these Southern Mexicans? They can play on that other side for the basketball. Can't mix it up and they play can. a game together? Like can't just walk through here. He's going to get assaulted. While our cameras watch from a distance, Kevin and Oliver play out their strategy. They make a beeline for the whites, their only possible allies on the yard. 